we're going to be going over how GraphQL resolvers work. After you declare some type definitions, you give in the user the things that they can call and the types that they should expect. So for example, a user can call register and they should expect a register response. The idea with resolvers is this is actually the implementation of this. And so we're going to put in here the operation, the actual registering of the user, for example. And then we're going to actually make sure we return the correct data that matches this response. So, so far we've seen basic examples of this right here. And I want to go over kind of more into what these resolvers are and what data we have access to. So we've talked a little bit about resolvers. You've seen that they're a function uh, and they need to return the type that we talked about up here. Uh, there's a little bit more to resolvers. So they actually, to start off, have four parameters passed into them. So these are the things that you can kind of work with to fetch any data or do the operations that you need to. The first one is usually called the parent or the root. Second one is gonna be the arguments. Third's the context and fourth is usually called info. Um, and again, this can be a function and we can do it like that. So now we're gonna go through each one of these parameters. I wanna start with the arguments. Uh, so this is exactly what we put up here. So in our login, we specified that there's going to be a single argument called user info, and it's gonna be of this type. So we have access to that through the args second argument here. Uh, so for example, I could destructure this if I wanted, and we could say user info, and we could use this to do something. Now, our login thing is not too impressive since we're just re returning a Boolean, but for example, we could change this to a string, and maybe we want to grab user info, and we can destructure it even further. So if we look at our user info type, we have a username, so I can grab the username and that's can be what I return. So if I give that a save, I can go over to my GraphQL playground over here and I can call that mutation. So we're gonna say login, pass in user info and we can also pass in a password, but again, that's not really doing anything right now. And you'll notice we get that username, hey, back in the response. And again, anything we pass in here, we're gonna get that right back because that's what our resolver is doing. It's taking the argument and it's just returning it. So that's the arguments. So it's gonna be whatever it's passed in. So now this is under a mutation, same works with queries. So queries and mutations, the resolver still gets the same parameters uh, either way. And so for example, we can do this for the hello query. So for example, here, I'm going to add a uh, name, which is gonna be a string and I can access that. So here I'm gonna say parent and I'm gonna grab the name argument and I'm gonna return name and we're just gonna say hey to them. So now I can call that. And as you would expect, when we call the name, it's gonna specify it there. And it's mad at us because we just haven't refreshed. So there we go. And we can see there's me. And again, if we add more text, it's gonna show up. All right, so that is the argument. The next one that I wanna go over is this context that we have access to. So this is something that you have access to uh, across all your resolvers. And it's something that's usually created in the up here on each request. So if I say context right here on Apollo server, uh, we can actually have an op and a function that returns an object. Um, and this object is gonna be the context and you can access it in any of your resolvers. So a common thing that you'll usually pass here is uh, sometimes the request and the response. So this is something that Apollo server gives you access to. So I can pass the request and the response there. Um, and we can see that in our context. So for example, I can console log the context and we can run this. Actually, we need to do the login to see it. Um, and we can see a whole bunch of stuff right here uh, because the request and the response objects are quite big. Um, but anyway, what these are, if you're not too familiar, these are the request objects and the response objects. And this is kind of, I guess we're not really using express right now, uh, but it has data related to the request. Uh, for example, the headers that are sent um, and whatnot. So you can use this in your uh, Resolver, so 
common thing that I've used before is I may say context.response and I can set a cookie doing that um, and I can just set the cookie there. And you may want to do different stuff. So knowing you have access to that's nice. Other things you can put in here is, uh, for example, if you ever heard of Data Loader, that's a pretty common GraphQL library. You'll usually see people wanting to pass it through the context, and so you'll create it here, or anything you want to have all your resolvers have access to. So another thing is you're usually going to be uh, working with a database, so you may add uh, any kind of database connection to the context here. Uh, so that's the other thing about these resolvers. They can be asynchronous. So I can use the async keyword here. If you're familiar with async and await and we can return a promise and that is totally fine GraphQL will re resolve the promise you'll notice we get the same thing here um, doesn't matter so async or not async it's going to resolve the promise and so what that means is you can pretty much do anything you want in the resolvers so here I can go check the password right if this was an actual login function uh, and we could just await the response something like that right and then pass in the password that we get from up there. Um, so you can do any kind of operations here. So not just connecting to a database, but also fetching from a REST API uh, or anything you really need to do. So the resolvers are don't the resolvers don't care what you use. Uh, you can be using a graph database. You can use Mongo, NoSQL, SQL doesn't matter. Uh, so that's the cool thing about GraphQL is it kind of works with any kind of backend layer that you want, any data layer that you want. All you, all you need to do is have an asynchronous function here that resolves the data. Uh, so that's context. We talked about arguments. Uh, I want to talk about info next. This is something you don't really uh, need to worry about and don't really need to use, especially as a beginner. I don't really use this at all. It's more used, for example, with libraries sometimes. Uh, but basically what this is, is it's basically a parsed version of the query that gets run. So what this, or the parsed query uh, that's getting uh, that's part of the request. So this thing is parsed because right now it's a string. Uh, I think they call it an AST, uh, but again, you don't really deal with this too much. So a lot of times when I'm creating a resolver, I'll have the parent arguments and context, and I won't even include the info because it's not really used. Now, there's one thing I need to go over real quick before we get into what the parent is. So the cool thing about GraphQL is you can resolve, for example, the register field and the login field, or the queries hello and user but you can also uh, resolve individual fields. So for example, we have a user type here. So I can create a resolver for the username. So how would I do that? So to do that, I'm going to say user, and then I'm going to say username, and then I'm gonna create a function for it. So I am username. So here, and uh, you're gonna notice a difference when we add this. So Let's go ahead and uh, call login returns a user. No, I think uh, register does. And let's just copy our uh, data here so we don't have to retype it. I'm just gonna say register. Um, and then we're gonna grab a user from this. I don't actually care to see the error right now. Uh, so one difference we're gonna see as we request this is it says I am username here. And so that you'll notice it's kind of interesting because we have the username as Bob right here. But you'll notice by me putting this here, it kind of overrided it. Uh, and before I go into why exactly it's doing that, real quick, I just want to go over uh, the syntax of this. So I said user up here. The reason why I said user is because the type is named user. So it kind of matches that. And then I called it username here. So I put username here. Uh, so that's how I know I'm overriding that field. Uh, okay, so I said I am username here. Uh, so what the parent has is it's going to have access to what the parent object is. In this case, this. So this is getting returned from register, um, and it kind of goes down in a recursive manner. Well, I don't know if you consider it recursive, but you go kind of uh, top down. Uh, so for example, here, if we look at our register, it's going to first uh, resolve the register response uh, here. It's going to first resolve it. Uh, this so by calling the register resolver then it's going to call a resolver for the field and message and the resolver for the ID and username to resolve each one of those fields uh, so in this case the parent is going to be the register because this was called before it so you have access to the data above you uh, in this case we have access to this 
So what that means is I can say parent.user.username. And, and actually, we don't even have access to a user here. I believe it's just parent.username. Uh, and a fun thing to do when doing this is to just console.log the uh, parent to get a good idea what it is. All right, so we restarted the server, run this again. Uh, we're now seeing Bob, which is what we should see. And we see now we have an ID and a username. So notice that right here in my register, I said ID and username. And so that's going to be the parent that's passed over here. Um, and so we have access to that here and we can just return that. So by default, that's what the resolver looks like. Uh, so if we don't touch it, here's what the resolver looks like. Uh, but you may be asking, why is this even useful, right? What can you do with this? Well, uh, this is actually a really handy feature of GraphQL because you can now do one, computed fields are really easy. So an example of that. Uh, is, I don't know, first letter of username. So this is just a computed field that we can create. And so here's how I want it to work. It's going to take the parent, and we're just going to return parent.username in the first letter of it, right? And so I just add a resolver for this. I need to also make sure that it's in my user, or else I can't even query it. Um, and so now we're going to call this refresh. And we can see there's a B there. So that's kind of interesting. So one thing you may notice here is catch is we're actually not returning it here. So we have this register resolver that does not return, right? Doesn't return the username. Well, sorry, the first letter of username. Um, and instead is being resolved here based on what the username is. So that's a really cool thing that you can do. And this also works no matter uh, where the user is being resolved from. So register returns a user, so does user, right? Uh, so it's not only register, we can do this for our user. ID, username, first letter of username, right? And we get a B. Now we have Bob in both these places. We can rename this to say Tom, and we're gonna notice we're gonna get a T there instead. That's pretty sweet. So we get we're able to access that field and get it resolved. So this resolver actually runs whether we get the call the user query, oops, or the register mutation. And the reason for that is they're resolving a user. And so this gets called every time a user wants to be returned, basically because we're both returning a user in our register response right here, and we're also returning a user up here in our query. So that is a pretty cool thing about GraphQL is these, these things that you can kind of add on later. Uh, this is kind of a computed field, but also it can be fields that are unrelated. So for example, you may fetch the user, uh, and that may be a totally different database query that you add here. Because again, this can be asynchronous, um, and it returns it. So this is another really cool thing about GraphQL that makes it super powerful. And again, we can add another version of this or another field on here. Um, and the other thing is, again, we can just make this nullable too. Um, and we can just return null if we want to here. And maybe we want to do it based off of something. Uh, for example, if the username is not passed in. Like we don't pass the username here. And let's make this nullable as well. Is we can just be like parent.username And we can have like a nice little ternary, or we can return null there. So now we're going to return null. I believe we changed register. And we can return null of both those fields. Um, and you can add as many of these fields as you kind of want to add. And so that's super handy. And I really recommend playing around with this, because this was something I didn't really understand at first. And you don't really view the power of it at first. So try creating kind of like these extra fields onto it. Um, and then kind of you'll create the own resolver for it and resolve it like that. And again, it doesn't actually get resolved at the top level, level here. Like we just have an object, right? And so now we're, we're actually adding this field on later, which is cool. Anyway, this is kind of a, probably a lot of information about how resolvers work. Uh, definitely recommend playing around with this and they'll slowly uh, kind of get a good idea of how they work.